Hi, good morning. Uh, this is ME233 in case you're not sure which class you're attending. Uh, this is a sort of a follow-up class for ME232, which I can see some of you have already taken. So this will be uh, a class about a lot more about practical and uh, selective topics of control engineering, which is something, something we always use, something that is more practical. Uh, and more detailedly, this is what I mean. Just a brief overall picture of the topics we're going to go through. You don't have to, in fact, if you understand any of this, it's great, but you don't have to have, have any kind of background for this. So uh, I'll just go through, mention some of them, and describe to you what's the big picture of all these. Why are we doing this? All right. So uh, these I have selected these topics, uh, ranging from, for example, here, dynamic programming and uh, common filter. The first, the first two, I would say, this is more like uh, uh, optimal control theory. Okay. And here you have stochastic control. Now in ME232, you have been dealing with mostly uh, uh, systems without noises. When you do observer design or when you do state feedback design, you don't have noise inside the system. And as a, as a matter of fact, you will see now, when you have noise, the design over there has to be modified. And you're going to have to see how these stochastic noises play a part in these kind of uh, estimation schemes. Then we'll talk a little bit more about from SISO to multiple single input, single output to multiple input, multiple output feedback design. We'll talk about some of the principles over there, and then we'll see how this SISO loop shaping, SISO control design techniques can be applied to MIMO systems as well. All right? And we'll do digital control implementation and design. We'll talk about uh, sampling theory, how you have designed a continuous time controller to be implemented in a discrete time system. All right? And then we talk about uh, feed forward design. And uh, we'll talk about feedback design, selective topics. All right? And in the end, about five, five weeks of lecture at the end of the course, we'll talk about uh, system identification and adaptive control. All right? OK, this is a brief summary of uh, who will be doing this with you for this semester. So I will be uh, with you for this entire semester, and I will have a, we have a teaching assistant, Chang Liu, who is sitting uh, in the back row over there, all right? So I'll be doing my office hours. Uh, I think this is also written in the one-page syllabus. I'll be doing office hours uh, Tuesday, Thursday from 1 p.m. to 2.30 p.m., all right? And then uh, our uh, TA's office hour will be announced as soon as all the schedules have been fixed. So hopefully we'll start, uh, we'll, we'll start following, up, following these office hours uh, from next week, all right? And uh, the class notes has been sent to the copy center, this, this, this address, 48 Shattuck Avenue, 48 Shattuck Square, all right? Uh, I haven't received a formal confirmation that they are already ready for pickup, but uh, if I do, I'll send a reminder. Uh, I'll send an email to all of you, OK? Uh, by the way, we, we have two parts. So make sure we buy it. Make sure you are buying two copies, all right? Part one and part two. Part one will be uh, everything I have mentioned over here. And then part two, we'll be doing this, uh, system identification and adaptive control, all right? Just uh, in case. And then uh, the requirements in the evaluations. We have a website for this class, all right? It's over here. Actually, uh, the first lecture, the notes for the first lecture has been uploaded over there, OK? Take a look uh, and try to see if you can, uh, if, you, if you find all the information relative over there. And then we're going to distribute uh, the homework solutions and the midterm solutions, finals, through this B-Course website. It's a sort of an upgraded version of B-Space, okay? 
make sure you have access to it. I think I have added everyone here if you have officially registered for the class, all right? If you don't have access to it and uh, if, if you're auditing or something, uh, drop an email to, to me or to the uh, GSI and let, let us know that you are enrolling, okay? So I mentioned this is a sort of a consec this is a class after ME232, uh, all right? So it's expected you have some kind of background about uh, basic uh, control design in state space, in transfer functioning, all right? Uh, we'll do lectures at this time, Tuesday and Thursday. And then we have a discussion session, one hour discussion session on Friday, every Friday. Uh, we won't have it for this week probably. Sanyu, are we gonna have a discussion this Friday? Next week, okay. So discussion is gonna start uh, next week, okay? Friday, 10 to 11 a.m. Uh, in this room, 1165 on the first floor, okay? Uh, evaluations, we're gonna have roughly nine sets of homeworks, which are gonna count 20% uh, of the uh, total score. And then we're gonna have uh, two in-class midterms. Mar mark these days over here, March the 6th and April the 15th, uh, 15th. okay? And this is sort of open summary sheet. You can have a one-page summary sheet for the first midterm, and you can have two one-page summary sheets for the second midterm, okay? If you have any kind of uh, possible time conflicts, uh, like you, you, can't, you can't make it to these days, let me know by the end of this week, okay? And then we'll have a final exam. This is uh, open notes, open reader, okay? Any questions for this? Part. Good. Oops. All right. I mentioned uh, uh, you guys are expected to have some background, so I have made the, the important things over there listed over here. So sort of as a review, see if you have the uh, like, like you can do this. We can do this checklist together. All right. So we. Uh, this way, all right? Uh, first of all, some basic Laplace and Z transformations, all right? How you can do this to continuous time and to discrete time sequences, all right? Then how you can model a linear dynamic system, obtain the transfer function, obtain the state-space models, and then how you can solve, solve these state-space models, obtain the equations, responses, all right? This is, this, the first part would be, uh, more about uh, system, system uh, deriving the system uh, dynamics. And then starting from here, we started talking about uh, system properties. Okay, we talked about, uh, not, not ILOC talked about, but Professor Tomizuka in ME232 talked about uh, stability in the sense of poles, eigenvalues, uh, the apno of stability. And then uh, have this concept of controllability and observability. L let me ask one question. For a transfer function, can we discuss controllability and observability? So controllability and observability are, are taught in the sense of state-space systems, right? If you, don't have, if you don't even have the states, how are you talking about you're controlling the states, right? So uh, that's controllability and observability, system properties. And then uh, ME232 discussed these state feedback and output feedback designs, all right? And uh, this is sort of one technique mentioned over there that uh, if the system is fully controllable, then you can do arbitrary pole assignment via feedback, all right? And then uh, following state feedback, then uh, ME232 talked about observers, state estimations, when there are no noise. Right? And then uh, we did state feedback uh, control design. At the end of the ME232, uh, it's, it's this, linear quadra quadratic optimal control, all right? Or LQ regulator. And then uh, over there, you, you sort of see, you, you sort of have a taste of optimal control, right? You know, LQ is minimizing some kind of quadratic, Q here is a quadratic, this means a quadratic cost, 
you're doing some kind of optimal control, all right, for a linear system. So uh, if, if, I, if, I, if I get the information correct, you were doing, most of the time, you were doing this continuous time design, all right, and possibly at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the semester, you had some sort of uh, views of the discrete time case, which is uh, what I will talk about today, all right? So I have written down the problem uh, statement over here. We're gonna probably uh, be able to solve this problem, okay? So some of you may wonder why I'm wearing a mic over here. That's because uh, ME232 will be webcasted. That means uh, someone will take the video, will, will take the screen capture of this one, and then will upload it to uh, Berkeley's YouTube channel, uh, or this iTunes U webcast Berkeley. All right, just me, not you guys. All right, if you, if you want, you are, you are more than happy to uh, be cap to be captured, but you have to sign a sort of uh, media release form. All right, so uh, yeah, this will be webcasted. But uh, uh, I don't have the access to the uploading process, so I don't know when, what time it will be uploaded. But if once I have the information, I will, I will put the links to you guys over here, okay? Uh, probably you can't see very clearly, but here are, there, there are some references if you are interested in to know in more details. And these references are uploaded on the course website. So you can find the details over there, okay? All right, so any questions for the general course uh, information? You guys are very eager to learn. You're all looking at this. All right, so if no questions, perfect. I'm gonna start talking about uh, the first lecture, okay? It's called uh, dynamic programming, all right? Uh, this, this kind of stuff, it's, it's very useful. It, it's, as a matter of fact, it's, it's still very popularly used as, as far uh, today. It was introduced in 19, uh, history, a, a little bit of history. It was introduced in uh, 1950s uh, by, by, a man, by a man called uh, Richard Bellman, all right? He developed this kind of thing. And then since its development, it has been implemented in all kinds of areas, all right? So it has vast applications, not just in control, all right? Uh, in control, in digital signal processing, in uh, pass planning, in all these kind of applications, uh, it has been, uh, it has dramatic impact for these kind of areas, okay? This, this word here, programming, all right? It has nothing to do with computers. Actually, as a matter of fact, at this kind of stage, this computers wasn't popular at all. So programming here means more planning, all right? For example, if you are, if you are traveling, if I wanna travel from the east coast to the, to the if I wanna tra want travel from the west coast to the east coast, I have to plan my trip. I want to go there as in the shortest distance path, all right? So that, that is what's meaning programming here, planning the trip, all right? So I, we have talked about some of these already, all right? The, the history and then useful applications. I want to I wanna mention one point here, just to let you know how this, this thing is useful. So in IEEE Global History Network, so it's, it's using this to describe dynamic program. A breakthrough which set the stage for the application of uh, functional equation techniques in a wide spectrum of fields, all right? So let's see how this is actually works. It, it, it's actually working, all right? Let me give you this one more, uh, one example to start with the discussion. All right, so this is called a path planning problem. I have a starting point, starting node, S. And I wanna go here, this is the end node. And I have, along the path, I have to go through several nodes and I can make choices at different places. These numbers here, one, two, three, four, indicates the cost 
in, in general, the cost for going each pass over here. For example, if this is a, if this is, I'm traveling by air, this can be the uh, distance between different cities or the fuel assumption between these lines over here. All right, so I'm gonna go here from here to here in the short, in the minimum cost pass, okay? For this simple problem, you probably can figure this out after you look at this long enough. You, you, can, you, can, you can sort of list all the possible passes uh, that you can do. But dynamic programming provides you one way to systematically do this, all right? So this is a key, key, uh, key idea, all right? For this la relatively complex and large scale problem, dynamic programming provides you a, a collection of small problems, okay? And by doing these small problems, you can solve this efficiently and then more systematically. All right, so let us start with this observation here. Now, suppo suppose your optimal pass contains this node here, C here, all right? Suppose, suppose this is uh, one pass on the optimal, one node on the optimal pass. Forget about, forget about the starting point and, the, and this point over here. What do you think the path, the, the pass from C to E has to be, if this is the optimal pass and this is one node on the optimal pass. Yeah, that's correct. So it has to be C, D, E. It cannot be C, A, B, and E, right? You can definitely see this is, this is more, has, has more cost, right? So in a, in a sort of more uh, uh, control, not control language, in a sort of more, uh, here, in a sort of more, I would say, professional language is this. If node C is on the optimal pass, then, there's a typo here, then the pass, the remaining pass from node C to node D has to be optimal, right? If I'm flying from west coast to east coast and I have stopped, for example, in uh, somewhere, in Minnesota, let's say. The pass, the remaining pass from Minnesota to the west, to the east coast has to be optimal. I don't want to stay in Minnesota for one night and then come back to San Francisco and then go to Boston. No, right? So this is what it's saying. The remaining pass from here to here has to be optimal. This is the idea of uh, optimal pass planning, right? So if you, if you buy that, Let's see how this big scale problem can be broke down into small problems. So I'm gonna define, I'm gonna define this. This E indicates the minimum cost from the starting point to this point. All right, so just to, to understand this, if I say this uh, B, it has to be the minimum cost from S to B, all right? So in this case, you can see it is S, A, B, right? It, it cannot be S, C, A, B. So the minimum distance from S to B, it's seven, right? So this is our notation, the notation we're gonna be following. Now, look at this. The distance, the minimum distance, E, now there are only two possible ways to reach E. Either you go through B, or you go through D, right? So the minimum, the distance has to be coming from this combination of two. It's the minimum of these two, all right? Either you start from this, either you start from node B, and then you have to or you start with the location D. And then if, if you start it here, then your additional cost is one. The only possibility is this, right? Now, over here, you have to use the distance to B and distance to D. Now, do it uh, step by step. The distance to B, let's see, what's the minimum distance to B? There's only one possibility. You have to go through A, right? So the minimum distance to D 
is the distance to A plus this cost on this path. And the minimum distance to D, can everyone see this? Those are sitting in the back? Good. All right, so the minimum to distance to D has to be, you have, to, you have two choices now, right? Either you, either you go through B or you go through C. No other possibilities. So it's the minimum of, uh, let's say, uh, let, let, let me start with this one. The distance to C plus three, this cost on this pass. Or you go through B, then you add this pass. Okay? Now you just, you just do this uh, step by step. Now you have to know distance, uh, minimum distance to C and distance to A over here, right? I would say this is step one, this is step two, this is uh, step three. The minimum distance to A has to be, someone help me here. Yeah, you can see this is one. So, uh, but more systematically, if you let the computer do this, you would have to tell the computer this. It's the distance to S, which is zero now you know, plus one, or the distance to C plus this one, four over here, right? Now just one more step. Distance to C, now I, you already know the size, so I won't uh, elaborate more. So it, it has to be two. Now, doing this kind of steps, you can immediately, I claim, you can immediately know this thing which you wanted, the minimum distance to E, right? Because from here, now you know, the distance to C is two, the distance to A is one, because this is one, and this is uh, six, right? So this is the minimum distance to A. Now using these two, go back here, you know the minimum distance to, e, to D has to be what? Two plus three is five. Oh, I have to use the minimum distance to B, so I have to compute this guy first. Now, the minimum distance to B is one plus six is seven. Now here, now we can do this. This is five because of this, and this is eight, so this is five, right? Now finally, come back here. B plus two is nine. D plus one is six. Now this is six, right? So you sort of, we sort of, sort of started backwards. So we sort of started looking at this point. Okay, what has to be from here to here, what has to be the minimum? And then think about it. When we compute the actual pass, we started off from this direction. So this is how we compute. This is how we compute. And this is, on this, on this side, this is how we analyze. Okay, this is sort of intuitive, right? If you're, if you're going to anywhere, you wanted the shortest path. You always start at the end location to see where uh, you're gonna go optimal, okay? So someone tell me, what, what's the minimum path now by looking at this? So I have to, let me use another, so I, I, can, I can write it here. So my end location is E, and then the previous node has to be, we computed this, it has to be this guy, D1. So it has to be this, D. And then from here, let's see where we can reach D in the minimum cost. It has to be this guy, right? Let, let me write down, let, let me know, highlight the shortest distance at each location. Okay, so uh, here, the first step is, the, the second to the last step is D, and then C, and then what? Yeah, it's S, right? So that's how you can obtain, how you can obtain the minimum cost and the minimum pass. Sort of as a summary, this is how we did, this is what we did, all right? We analyzed the problem backwards, writing this down, E, B, D. And when we compute it, we do this forward computation, starting from C, A, B, D, E, right? So that's, 
the sort of the idea of dynamic program, a very simple one. But in practice, this can be way more complicated and has a lot of uh, good applications if we understand the key concept over here. So this is a Bellman's principle, as a summary, this is Bellman's principle of optimality. Okay. From any point on an optimal trajectory, this is very important, you have to be on the optimal trajectory. From any point on the optimal trajectory, the remaining trajectory has to be optimal for the corresponding problem if we start it at that point, okay? All right, Bellman, Richard Bellman is a very wise man. He attended uh, Princeton at the age of 26, and then he finished PhD, guess what, in three months. <laughs> you can check this, I'm not lying. But, but it has background though, uh, it's in the war, so there, there might be difficulties in various aspects, I don't know, but uh, he finished it, he, he, he made it. Okay, the reason we are, we, I introduced dynamic program is because of this. Uh, we wanna do optimal control. So th as, a, as a sort of general optimal control problem, this is a statement, okay? Giving a general discrete time plan, all right? Xk plus one equals F, Xk, Uk, and the K, all right? So I didn't specify any spe specific form of the system. It can be linear, nonlinear, or even time varying, all right? And there can be state constraints. The state has to be inside of some sort of uh, space. And this input can also, stay, can also have a constraint, all right? And uh, uh, this is way general than what we have learned in ME232, okay? And it's more difficult. So the performance index is this, okay? J, is a scalar value, is a scalar value, which is a function of the final state. This I would say, uh, the, the, the terminal cost, all right? Terminal cost at the final state, N is the final time which we want to minimize this cost. And the function of this small accumulation of cost, starting from K equals to zero to K equals N minus one, all right? So this, is sort of the cost along the path, and this is the terminal cost, okay? S and L are real scalar values functions. So our goal is to minimize this. This is what we want to do. Minimize J, obtain this uh, optimal control sequence, U zero to U n minus one, okay? That's the problem. And then now, now as a matter of fact, you can see this uh, discrete time LQ problem is, uh, simplified version of this. Well, our system is a linear system, and our uh, performance index is a quadratic performance index, okay? These are quadratic functions of x, these are quadratic functions of u. Okay, That's, this is a general problem. And uh, as a matter of fact, this general difficult problem can be solved in dynamic programming, okay? So let's see how it does. Actually, let me. Take a seat here. So whenever we, are, we have to do some sort of heavy mass, I will, I, will, I will write the detailed equations. And then I suggest you to also do that instead of reading the notes or handouts if you have it, okay? So let's do this, uh, general dynamic programming. Dynamic programming for uh, optimal control. Okay, so I'm gonna define something for convenience. I'm gonna define U, big U, capital U, as the control sequence from U, K, to U, K minus, a uh, plus one, all the way to U, N minus one big N minus one, all right? So this is the cost, this is the control sequence starting from time K, right? UK, UK plus one, all the way to UN minus one. Now, uh, 
If you think about what we have done in dynamic programming, we sort of develop this notion of, we call it cost to go, which is saying this, J, K, let's say, the optimal cost to go, right? We are minimizing, so if we, suppose we start at time K, suppose we are starting right there, then what we want to do is we want to obtain this optimal control sequence that's gonna minimize my cost, which is, uh, if you see, uh, what I have introduced in the last slide is this. Uh, is this terminal cost plus this uh, cost on the pass. Okay, right? So this is the cost to go at time k. Now, think about it. And you can see this, this is valid. If I'm minimizing with respect to UK, then it's the same as this. Everything inside here is the same as this, all right? This is because UK, which is defined here, is nothing but this uh, small UK combined with this. Right? Now you can see this is a capital U K plus one. Right? I have done nothing but uh, redefining this control sequence over here. Now, if you do this, something interesting happens. If I'm minimizing, no, no, no let me write it. Uh, most explicitly. If I'm minimizing this whole thing here, I'm, I can take out this guy. I can take out the cost at time k. So I'm taking out one cost from this summation over here, and then the remaining part is gonna be the same, plus uh, summation from, now it's from k plus one to n minus one, and this L. All right, I'm taking out one, one part from this summation here. Now look at this whole thing here. If I say I'm minimizing using this uh, decision for variables u, k plus one, if I'm doing this alone, will I be able to influence this guy? This thing depends totally on x, k, u, k, and k. But my control is for the future. So you can see this thing won't be able to influence this guy here. So that means I can take this minimization sort of thing to be inside and shift it over here. This thing won't be able to influence it. So more mathematically, this is what I mean. It equals to mean u small u k plus th this minimization here. This is u k plus one uh, s x n here plus the summation from uh, k plus one to n minus one, and this L. Uh, I have to have another bracket. All right, everyone sees this? Good. Now, look at this guy. Minimizing from k plus one to this cost what does this guy equal to? Exactly. It's J uh, K plus one. All right? Is the is the minimum cost if we start everything at time K plus one. All right? Now 
writing this down. Yeah, I can use this now. <coughs> writing this down here, okay? Then we have essentially sort of uh, solved the problem, okay? We have written down this, which now you see is this. This is the optimal cost to go starting at time k plus one. These two guys are equal. Now, just focusing on the original cost to go, and this last line over here. We have now the same thing as past planning. We have a sub problem to solve. If we want to obtain this, then it's just about minimizing this one cost, optimal cost, plus this cost on this pass. All right? This is exactly what you have seen earlier in the past programming, in the past planning problem. All right? If you want to do minimization, if we want to obtain the minimization, we break it into small problems. Well, at each step, I'm doing a small minimization problem. All right? If I'm doing this, then this is the optimal cost to go at the previous time step. So as you can imagine now, for sure, we can solve this problem just as simple as what we did in the past planning. All right? So just a few f final checkpoints. Now, do, doing this, the final, the final time, at the final time, the boundary condition, okay, which is, uh, which is, if you, if you seek the uh, notation here, at time n, the final location on the pass, it has to be minimum of this thing here. But when you are already there, you don't have this, you don't have this intermediate pass. You only have this remaining final pass. You only have this remaining final cost, right? So the boundary condition for this iterative problem is a, uh, is this, at time n is uh, s x of n. Now, this one notion I have to mention here. If you notice my writing, I wrote it, the optimal cost to go at time k, see here, is a function of the state of x k. Similarly, when I, when I wrote down here, the optimal path, the optimal cost to go at time k plus one is a function of x of k plus one. I didn't write down anything else. Okay? Think about it. This is, this is the, the same as the past planning problem. If I'm flying, let's say, from San Francisco to Boston and I have to stop at Minnesota, the minimum cost to go if I start at Minnesota is just a function of Minnesota. It's not a function of San Francisco, right? It's just the distance between Minnesota and Boston. Nothing else. Yeah. The minimum cost has nothing to do with San Francisco, right? So it's the same thing here. The minimum cost is only a function of the current state, right? If it's k here, it's x of k here. k plus one, x of k plus one, all right? Nothing else. So now, the problem can now be solved by solving a sequence of problems, starting from here to one step by step, going backwards to n plus one, to n minus one, to all the way to here. That's the basic procedure for uh, dynamic programming for optimal control. So I mentioned this is the tough problem. What, we, what we, we're going to mainly focusing, be focusing on is uh, a simplified version, the uh, LQ problem. Well, now you, uh, I have mentioned this. L, it's saying I have a linear system. L is, means a linear system. And Q is uh, I have a quadratic cost. It's because these two, these two notions are very important. It's only if, if you have this linear system and quadratic cost, you can obtain very, very nice solutions. Okay? So uh, let's see. Let, let me re read this again. Uh, I have written down also on the board over there. So the system dynamics is this. A, B. Notice that. I have, say, 8K, so the system matrices can be time-varying, no problem, okay? 
and the initial state is x of zero. The performance index, okay, all these system matrices, all these performance matrices in the performance index, they can also be time varying as well. This problem can be solved by uh, dynamic programming. Okay, some assumptions, uh, just as a review, you might have already seen it. The uh, uh, performance matrix for X, the constraint matrix for X, has to be positive semi-definite. And the matrix for the terminal uh, state has to be positive semi-definite. And this control uh, matrix over here, R, has to be positive definite, okay? Now, use dynamic programming. Where do you think I should start? If I give you this problem. Correct, from N. And then I define this cost to go, right? Starting from time step N, I have to go backwards. All right? So now when you're doing this, this is what you're gonna define. The optimal cost to go from time, uh, from time K is defined by this. It's the minimum of this guy. Uh, this is the, this, this comes from this summation sign here. It's the, op, it's the cost I have to pay along this pass n, right? From time n, from time k uh, to k plus one. This is the cost I have to pay along the pass. It comes from this summation sign over here. And then this is the optimal cost to go. Cost to go at time k plus one. Okay? And then again, with the boundary conditions over here. This is the, at the final time, at the final time, I only have this final constraint here. I don't have any additional pass, additional cost I have to pay. Okay? Uh, this is the definition of the problem. Now, as a general mass review, uh, okay. as a general mass review, uh, I want to go through this kind of basic facts of quadratic function. Okay, uh, consider I have a quadratic function, f, which is a function of u, which is a, it contains the Quadratic term of u, it contains a linear term of u, and then it can contain some other kind of constant terms of q, okay? Uh, if I wanna minimize this quadratic function, okay, with respect to m, uh, let's say, uh, let's say m is positive definite. If I wanna minimize this quadratic function, what we do do, just as an initial guess, u is the uh, variable, and uh, this is the function I want to minimize. You can, you, can, you can sort of have an intuitive idea. For example, if I want to minimize 2x squared plus 3x plus 7, what would you do over there? Take the derivative, right? And everything is the same here. If you want to minimize this, take the derivative of this function with respect to u. The only care, if you're not familiar with this, the only thing you have to be careful is how you take the derivatives. So, uh, I mean, let, let's review these facts. Uh, if I take the derivative of, I'm focusing on the second term here. If I wanna take the derivative of uh, p transpose times u with respect to u, all right? Let's say, let's say u is a vector of uh, u1 and u2, okay? Then if I take this derivative, it's nothing, it's nothing but doing this. I'm taking the derivative of p transpose times u, which is p1 times u1 plus p2 times u2 with respect to u, all right? So I have two terms in u, so I'm taking explicitly with respect to u1, and then the same thing here. With respect to u2. 
So this is the result. Someone tell me what, what, what's the numbers here. If I take the first derivative with respect to u1, it is p1. The second, p2. So as a, as a quick notation, it is p. Right? It's a vector p, a column vector p. Now, this first result can be generalized. If I'm taking the partial derivative of u transpose p, what do you think the result will be? This, this, this guy, uh, I swapped the orders. It's exactly the same, right? You can, you can, e you can either do this guy. You can write down what is this uh, as a complete mathematic formula. Or you can do this. U transpose P is a number, right? It's the same as P transpose U. They are both numbers, right? So you can do this. It's the same. Okay. Now, now we, with these guys, we can take a look at uh, the first term, uh, partial u transpose m u partial u. This guy's it's slightly more. Uh, so now we, I have two terms. I have two u's. Now, if you if you remember the chain rule, this is what I have to. I have to. I have to. Take the with respect to the first one, and then I have to add it up with respect to the partial derivative of the second. All right. So I have to do this. I have to. I have to sort of. Uh, let me see. I have to sort of regard the first. The, the 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 second two terms together. And then I have to. When I do the second step, I have to do. I have to. No, this is a. Uh, When I do the second time, I have to do this, right? This is a sort of uh, the idea from the chain rule. Now, if I want to do this guy, this is exactly very similar to this, right? Because u is a vector. m times u, a matrix times a vector, is a vector. So it's exactly the same as this, because it's a p sort of as the mu here. What will be this guy, the result? mu, right? Then the same thing doing here. What will be the result? M transpose U. So this is, is sort of doing this. Okay. Now uh, I mentioned that M is a positive definite matrix. So in this class, when I say some matrix is positive definite, I'm assuming it's symmetric. Okay. So now, so the the, the final result is going to be this: two M U. Because uh, m transpose is the same as m. Okay, so this is the final result. So now with this, yes. Okay. Uh, the, the last one, right? Mm, yeah. The student asked why this this holds. I have two here. Uh, let me give, for example, one one example. When you do the derivative of, uh, let's say, x square, let's say, a simple case. It's x times x. Now, when you do the derivative, now you know this is very easy. Uh, dx square divided by dx. No. It's, uh, let me write it, uh, let me write a start a new page because I'm going to need it. When you do x derivative of this with respect to this, you know it's 2x, right? So this is sort of the idea, okay? Now, if you combine, if you x square, you, you think about x square as x times x. Actually, you're doing it twice. You're doing, you're doing this, dx, dx first, then you, are, you have remaining x over here. Mm. 
You mean you mean this result? Uh, yeah, P is not a constant. Yeah, so that that's why actually that's why we have two terms. Sort of. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Uh, come back to me uh, if you want to know the details. But this is sort of as a easier way to to get this to your mind. All right. Now. We are here. OK. Uh, now you know how to take the partial derivative. Partial f respect to partial u. OK, I have to say u or u naught. OK, so following what I have just done, the partial derivative of the first term is going to be m u naught, because this, there's a one divided by two here, so it's mu over here. And then the partial derivative of the second term is p. And the last term doesn't depend on u, so it's zero. Okay, but when you do this, now you can obtain the uh, optimal uh, control, control law. u optimal is uh, you, take, you take this on the right hand side and then you invert this matrix, so you gotta get this, okay? This result uh, is actually very useful, regardless whether I'm doing optimal control or not. This is useful in general. And then the optimal cost, if you substitute this guy inside this, you're going to get this. It's a quadratic function uh, of p over here. Just, to, just put this back here, OK? Now I'm going to immediately start using this uh, fact of quadratic functions. Uh, for convenience, let me write the result down because uh, I'm going to immediately use it over here. You can take a look first while I'm writing down the result. Okay? Uh, so I got, I got to do this optimal cost to go thing from n to n minus 1, all right? So I'm using the uh, dynamic programming result. The optimal cost to go uh, at time n plus 1 is, uh, is this. It's the cost I'm going to have to pay at time n minus 1 to reach n plus the cost, the optimal cost at time n, right? So this guy is a j n naught. Okay, just by the uh, previous analysis. Okay, now you see immediately why I was doing that at the one slide earlier. This function, look at this one. It's a quadratic function of u. Okay, with respect to some other terms. If I want to minimize this, I have to know how to solve that quadratic uh, problem. So let me uh, write this result over here. So. If I want to do mean u, f of u, which is uh, 1 divided by 2, u transpose m u plus p transpose u plus q, and uh, m is positive definite here. Then the optimal, which we have derived, optimal control is this, and the optimal cost is a negative 1 divided by 2 p transpose m p plus q. Huh? Uh, oh, m inverse here. Yeah. OK. So I'm just going to use this. I can very quickly solve this problem. Okay, I mentioned this is a quadratic function of u. Uh, if I want to solve, when I write it, I write it as a function of x of n plus n minus one. Okay, but I have a x of n here, so it, it is here we have to substitute what x of n equal to. X of n 
equal to a k a n minus one uh, x of n minus one plus b n minus one u n minus one. So just substitute this system dynamics inside this uh, quadratic function over here. Okay, you're gonna get this. When I do that, substitute this inside, I'm gonna have another quadratic function of x n minus one, right? Because I have a quadratic function of x n here. So put this back here. I'm gonna have this up here. Quadratic function of x of n minus n minus one. This term is equal to this term here. And the rest of the terms are, are the same. Okay? Everyone sees this? Now look at this one. You can immediately apply this result here. If I ask you what is the optimal control law to minimize this quadratic function of u, quadratic function of u, here, quadratic function of u, what will be the optimal cost? Just by taking the partial derivative, we can obtain the result, okay? It's got to be negative, negative here, negative the, mate, the inverse of the matrix that is, that is staying uh, in this quadratic function of u times the vector that is uh, staying ahead of u over here, right? Just by using this result, what will be the uh, matrix for the quadratic term of u by looking at this guy? This requires a little bit of uh, observation. The quadratic matrix, the, the matrix staying in the quadratic term of u, first of all, this is one, right? This one doesn't contain any function of u. Look at this one. What is the matrix that, that stays uh, in the quadratic term of u? Right? So it, it's, it's this term. Is this term and this term, when they multiply together, they will create a quadratic function of u. So the, the matrix over there, uh, is, here, is this. Now you have the transpose here. So it's U transpose B transpose times S times B, then U, right? So in total, you have this. The matrix staying in the quadratic term of U, it's got to be R plus this thing here. R plus B transpose S times B. Then take the inverse, just as what I did over there, okay? Now, do it, a back, uh, do it once again. What is the matrix? What's the matrix in the linear term of u? It's not gonna occur here. This is a quadratic function. It's not gonna occur here. It's occurring here, right? What is the matrix for the linear term? What, what's the vector, actually? Uh, I had a, it shouldn't be a matrix, it's a vector. What's the vector uh, scalar inside the linear term of u? So it will happen if this term is multiplied with this term. It will also happen if this term is multiplied with this term, right? Now, uh, just, just do it. Uh, if this term is multiplied with this term, what we're what we gonna have? Mm. Okay, if this, term, if this term is multiplied with this term, we're gonna have x transpose n minus one, a transpose n minus one, s, b, n minus one, u, n minus one. Okay, so that's the first term. This one, uh, combination with this one. And then this one, combination with this one. I'm gonna get u transpose n minus one, b transpose n minus one, s, uh, a, n minus one, x, n minus one. Okay, now, uh, someone just tell me, by observing this, are these scalars or matrices? This whole thing. This has to be a scalar, right? So because, at, because of the fact they are scalars, now you see, this is a scalar, so it's equal to the transpose of itself. Because it's a scalar, you, you don't get anything by taking the transpose. Now if you take the transpose, you get exactly the same thing. X, X transpose, A, A transpose, S, I've told you S is symmetric, all right? So now, adding up, I have two terms of this. 
this is what you're going to get. Yeah, let, let me just write it down. Adding up, you're going to get 2. Let me see which order I want to choose. I probably want to choose, uh, I want to choose the first one. So it's going to be 2x transpose n minus 1. A, N, A transpose N minus 1, S, B, N minus 1, U, N minus 1. Okay? Now remember, there's, there's, a, yeah, there's, there's a scale of 1 divided by 2 here. So in the end, this, this 2 is going to cancel. Okay? So that's why uh, you're going to get this result here. Okay? It's the inverse of the um, M matrix, which we have just analyzed times the, uh, I've told you this one is going to cancel, times the uh, vector scalar ahead of the U term, all right? It's a P over there, all right? So take the transpose of this guy, you're going to get this. B transpose S A X and minus 1, all right? Everyone with me? So this is the optimal control law for LQ at time n minus one. Yes. Yes. If they are not symmetric, we have to do additional steps. Yeah. But uh, as you think about it, when you are doing this kind of minimization problem, you want it to be symmetric, sort of. For example, take a look at this uh, this line here. Mm. Uh, mm. So one of the students asked uh, about the assumptions of quadratic linear LQ problems. We say, for example, when we say x of k, let, let me use the constant q. The student asked the, uh, about this thing, student was concerned why this has to be symmetric. Uh, take one example, for example. Uh, take one uh, numerical example. If this is not symmetric, let's say. Let's say 1, 1, negative 3, 0. And uh, then this guy is going to be equal to x1 k square plus x2 k square then you have some kind of combination term between x1, k, and x2, k, right? Just when you are designing this, it gives you less intuition. If, if you are minimizing a state, if you're minimizing, let, let's say just as a simple case, if you're minimizing this, it's less intuitive if you do this this way. Because you want to say, for example, the states, you're minimizing the states, all right? Now you're doing this combination term. I'm not saying this is not possible. It is actually possible. And we will do one problem like that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that answers your question, right? Yeah. OK. Let's see where we are. We have started with the general uh, optimal control problem. And then we went through this linear quadratic optimal control problem. And we derived the control law. Now, I'm just going to use it, uh, go one step further. This is what we have discussed. Uh, at time k, the optimal cost is this, is this cost, is the terminal cost. At time n minus 1, the optimal cost is the minimization of this big quadratic function of u and x. OK? We have derived the optimal control sequence u of n minus 1. Now, uh, just go one step further here. If I plug in u n minus 1 to uh, the optimal u n minus 1 to this guy, 
I'm going to get the optimal cost to go, right? Which is uh, I just substitute u, uh, the optimal u minus one to this function here. Okay, this is the result you're going to get. And the way to understand this is again by using the formula we just uh, derived for the general basic uh, quadratic function. Okay, so it's going to be. Let me bring up. Let me bring up this. For those who are viewing uh, from webcast, I'm just going to use this once again, OK? The optimal cost by doing the substitution here, remember this format. It's going to be negative 1 divided by 2, p transpose m inverse p plus q, OK? Now here, the optimal cost has to be you see exactly this is happening. It's some kind of symmetric form. And then inside is some inverse of matrix, all right? You have seen how we derive this inverse matrix here, OK? And then you see here, this is sort of the P here, this thing. Yeah, here. This is the matrix. This is the matrix corresponding to here. And this, this whole thing is the vector P here. And the other side, I'm just doing, uh, on, on this side, I'm just doing a transpose of this vector here. This, this, this transpose of this vector here. Okay? Now, there's one more term, right? Th this term, this term. What do you think? is the constant term in this quadratic, big quadratic function. The term that's not dependent on u. What will be that constant term? Is this one, right? This is one, one of it, it's not all of it, right? This function, this, this term doesn't depend on u. And then look at this one. When I do this combination, this, and this is going to create another term that's independent of u. And you see exactly this is what's happening here. This q n minus 1 is this one. This a transpose s a is coming from here, right? a transpose s a. OK? So you see exactly this, we're just using nothing but this result over here, OK? Now, as a no, sort of notation convenience. I'm going to define the whole term, which is a quadratic function of x n minus 1 here as a basic, as a term. I'm going to wrap this up. I'm going to wrap the whole thing, the whole uh, equation term as uh, matrix P n minus 1. Yeah. So this is what I will be denoting, just because I want to be. I want it to be, sort of has a structure in the analysis. At time n minus one, the optimal cost is a quadratic function of x n, and at time n minus, at time n, and this is at time n minus one, the optimal cost is a quadratic function of x of n minus one. Okay. Okay. Now. I have defined, if you noticed, S as P of N, okay? And here, I have S terms of S. So to make it more structured, I can substitute P of N, with, we substitute S with P of N in this function here, all right? Over here. Then I'm going to get this. I'm going to get this new notation here, OK? So if you remember, ME232, this is the Riccati equation, the quadratic equa a quadratic sort of equation that's connecting between Pn and Pn minus 1, OK? We'll talk about how to understand the Riccati equation in a few more lectures, all right? So I can do the same thing. 
I can, I can express the optimal state feedback law as a function of Pn and then x of n minus y. So you already know the importance of this control law and why it's convenient. It's because this whole term over here is a matrix. And then we are doing nothing but state feedback control. So doing state feedback control can let us achieve optimal LQ solution. So th this is the uh, main power and main message over here. Okay, so you can you can start. I started with time n. I go. I went to time n minus one. But you can think about it. If I start at any time k and I go backwards k k minus one, the analysis will flow as well. All right. So this is the general steps of. Uh, from k plus one to k. So if I started at k plus one, I express the optimal cost to go at k plus one as a quadratic function of x of k plus one, uh, the, the p matrix p of k plus one. And then just analogous as what I did uh, from n to n minus one, we can get at time k, the optimal cost is a quadratic function of x with this Riccati equation. And then the optimal state feedback law. Okay, so uh, I did the, the, the analysis down here is for, it, it works for time varying matrices A, B, uh, yeah, A and B. But uh, we'll be focusing mostly on uh, time invariant cases where A, B are constant, okay? But the message here is kind of interesting, okay? Think about how we're gonna implement this control by just looking at these equations. Think about how we're gonna implement, how we're gonna do this. If I wanna compute U, I'm gonna need the system B and A. This is not, but I'm gonna also need, so this, this is what we define. But we're gonna need PK plus one. Now, if you need PK plus one, put it back here. PK plus one is gonna require you PK plus two. Now iterate, uh, pk plus two depend on pk plus three and all the way to pn. So when you actually implement this, when you actually implement this, okay, this is a summary. pk plus one depends on qk plus two and then pk plus two and then all the way. So when you actually implement this control law, actually u of zero it's going to depend on all the future P1 to Pn, right? To Pn minus 1, right? Which, looking at this Riccati equation here, which is going to require us the knowledge of all the future Q matrix, A matrix, R matrix. Yeah, that's all. So this is what I said here, which is going to depend, which going to depend on all these future knowledges of A, B, R, Q. Okay. But this is no problem for us. It looks complicated, but it's no problem because uh, these P, they can be computed offline, right? Because the P matrix doesn't depend on X. So we can compute this Riccati equations offline first, and we can obtain all the P1 to Pn minus 1. Then we can impl implement the control law online. So that's how the optimal solution is implemented online. All right. Uh, I'm gonna use perhaps another six minutes to, to sort of discuss the most generally applied control law, okay? So I'm doing here, uh, this is sort of a long and uh, slightly more complicated version of what we're gonna implement in practice. In practice, A, B, A, A, B, R, A, B, R, Q, they're mostly, in the usual case, we, we let it to be constant. If we have advanced design, we can make it time varying. But these are usually constant. And then, in practice, what we minimize is usually 
this final time, this final time n in practice, uh, we would usually take it to infinity. Say we're going to minimize the cost all the way in the future. Okay, so in practice, what we do is what we call usually a infinite horizon discrete time LQ. This is the easiest case, all right? So instead of the previously finite horizon discrete time LQ, we do infinite time horizon LQ, okay? And then I'm gonna review some properties of this uh, design. Okay, uh, this is a quick summary of what we have done uh, in this lecture. Okay, this is for the time varying case. Okay, now if I assume, if I assume time constant A and B, then let's see what will happen. So I created, we have one example here. Okay, a second order system where the matrices uh, a and B, they are time, they are, they are time invariant, okay? T here is uh, it's one, it's a uh, sampling time, okay? So the way, so this is a double integrator. The way to look at this is uh, you look at the first term, x1, x1 of k plus one equals to, let me write it here, x1 k plus one equals to x1 of k plus t x2 of k plus T squared divided by two U of K, all right? So think about uh, velocity and uh, distance. The distance at ne next time interval is the previous distance plus the velocity times the time plus one divided by two T squared U K, okay? This is, consider this as an acceleration, all right? So this is a double integrator. And the performance index here, uh, I'm using constant performance matrices, Q and R over here. Okay, Q is a symmetric positive definite, positive semi-definite, R is a positive, okay? So, I'm, we're gonna examine what this Riccardi equation is gonna give us. What's the solution of P is gonna look like if I take, for example, uh, different values of Pn. I take different values of uh, the terminal condition. I just see how this is gonna do, behave. And this is the result. Okay, so if I optimal horizon as 10, then I choose the final condition of P as a uh, one one over here, diagonal one one. This is the solution of the Riccati equation. So it's gonna go backwards. And then you see, it sort of converges to something, right? Let's, yeah, this is, this is doing nothing but solving this equation here. So this is the result. Now, let, let, let me mark these values it converges to. Eight and three. Okay, now. I'm gonna do, I'm gonna change the final time horizon from 10 to 30. And then this is the converged values of P. Three and eight. Now, if I change, I keep the same time, time frame, and I change the terminal condition from this to this, okay, you see? It's, it's this two and zero, from this to this. Again, you see it's converging to something, three and eight. They are all converging to the same thing, regardless of how I initial the terminal condition. Okay, so some observations. It's because of this, uh, we can, we can uh, inf infinite time horizon LQ very easily, okay? So first of all, PK is indeed always symmetric. Okay, it's converging to, it's, it's a little bit difficult to see here, but you see two of the variables, two of the elements converges to three, and two other variables, elements converge to eight. 
So if you really plot it, it's symmetric. Now, regardless of the boundary condition, P of n, the solution of the Riccati equation converges to the same steady state value, right? Even for this very simple problem, well, the time frame, I'm just doing, considering the cost in the future 30 time steps, it converges to this constant value very quickly, right? So this is saying for the majority of times, we are actually implementing a constant value of P. So because of that, uh, the control law, you see, is converging to a constant state feedback control law. Instead of this big time-varying time matrix P, we have a time-varying time matrix P, uh, and here a time-invariant matrix P. Okay, so this is gonna save a lot of computations as you can imagine, all right? So uh, this is an introduction of why infinite horizon LQ and why constant matrices can be applied in LQ, all right? We're gonna talk about uh, details. We're gonna talk about why it actually converts. We can actually prove that this will hold. We can prove that this, this will happen under certain conditions, okay? All right, so that will be the end of this lecture. See you on Thursday.